Now, I was told I was to relate some stories involving my dad and myself. If I told you all the stories involving the, that relationship, some of you would cringe. Some of you get up and walk out of here. So I'm going to only tell you the, what I think are interesting things. Now, one of the things I want to tell you is, uh, remember when Roosevelt was up for his fourth term? <laughs> well, as long well, I can't remember. You know the year. You can remember. Well, let me. 1844. All right. Now, my father took me with him to Chicago to the Democratic National Convention. And not knowing a heck of a lot about the politics, he. Now, this is really going to shock some of you. He gave me $5. <laughs> <laughs> Bernard, the World's Fair is here. Why don't you go to the World's Fair now and enjoy yourself, because you, be, you won't enjoy all these speeches. And he was absolutely right. What really shocked me, $5, he only gave me $2 for Christmas. <laughs> so I went to the place, and I, I spent, oh, I spent a couple hours there. It was very interesting. I spent the whole five dollars, so I came back. You know what I spent the five dollars on? I never told my dad either. I watched. <laughs> <laughs> You're close. I spent the whole five dollars. I made three trips to a tent where, guess who was there? Sally ran this famous All stripper. right. <laughs> and I come back, and my dad said, "You have a good time." I sure did. I learned, I learned a lot, too. I never went to anything else. I want to tell you something else. I, my dad was kind of mean at times. Especially, you know, there were nine of us on the dinner table. And about once a week, we would have steak. Good steak, too. I don't, he had a pull with it. He never even bought from the retail stores. He had, he had a pull with the wholesale house. So he bought all those meat wholesale house. But here's what we do. Nine of us would sit there. And he cut us all. We all had. We had plenty to eat. All piece of meat. We got our potatoes and our vegetables. And what always griped the hell out of him was when all the meat was cut up and everyone was eating. He would take a piece of bread and he'd sop up all that lovely juice. <laughs> Never did I ever get a taste of it until I was married and I did the same damn thing with my family. <laughs> and I'll tell you only only one thing about him. In fact, I, I won't tell that. I've taken up enough time with all these other people. No. But uh, but uh, I, I could go on forever and talk about my dad and myself. I'd like to tell you one thing about my mother, if I might. Please. Mother was in the nursing home in Denver. And one time, I came up there. I was there all alone. And she was very alert that day, which was not exactly the case every time. And she said, no, Bern, she patted me on the hand like this. She said, you know, Bernard, I love all my kids so much. But she says, you know, you and Georgia were the rotten apples of the barrel. Father ever say anything besides yep 
with no <laughs> And our dear old dad died quite easily. <laughs> and this, I have to say, this is phenomenal. Of my uh, comments. The rest of them are in my story. No, but I think you ought to, there's, there's a letter in there, but I think you ought to tell the story about the time that, uh, that George didn't get in the car. He's Oh, he's going to tell it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you remember George? <laughs> Maybe I'd better tell him. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. Anyway, every year, my grandfather Schmidt had a uh, wonderful cabin, sort of rusty, yeah, but it's on Lake Milton in Minnesota. And he piled all of us into his. Oh, yeah. No, he had a star. Yeah. One time he had seen it. It had, it had, rolled up. You had to roll them up by hand. Did your and grandfather had fenders. No, my dad. But Grandfather Schmidt owned the cabin okay. at Lake Mill okay. And that's where we went for a freebie vacation every year. And also all 13 families came to visit while we were there. Anyway, we were on the way, and Dad said before we started out, he said, I want everyone to go to the but we're not stopping at the forget. Sounds like Bob. Yeah. <laughs> so off we go, and I think the first stop was still in South Dakota. And we all got out, including the dog. And oh. we, <laughs> we got to the ladies' room and the dance room. And so uh, then we all piled the car. Dad usually took the count, but I think he probably forgot. Uh -oh. Anyway, there was a lot of giggling in the back. Well, I was sitting up between Mother and Dad, and the baby, and I think that must be friends, was on his lap, mother's lap. Mama, mama. And there was a lot of stuff going on in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, Dad said, what's going on back there? And there was no, more giggling. And then someone said, we forgot George and the dog. <laughs> <laughs> And there's George standing with the owner of the filling station and the dog. Everybody's crying. They didn't think he could take it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got Incidentally, Dad taught all We were swimming when we were two or three years old, I thought. We used to go to Canyon Lake in Rapid City. Every night he'd come home from work at 5 o'clock pile us all in the car, and we'd go for a swim. And if you didn't get in the water, he'd push you off the dock. <laughs> That's how I learned to swim. I learned this lake no point. But we'd go swimming at Canyon Lake every night in the summertime. <laughs> well, he also used to take us from Dallas, South Dakota, to Burke, South Dakota, Berkeley. And, and we'd go swimming in the... We'd go to Burke, where he worked in the bank, and we'd change our clothes at Burt, and then we'd go to this gravel pit and go swimming. And there was no gradual beach on that or nothing. It just went right straight down, 20, 30 feet. And that's what we needed. I want to add a couple of things here. First of all, uh, my uh, paternal grandparents, uh, uh, Frank and uh, Gertrude Schmidt and Avon, Minnesota, they had 13 children, but what he neglect, neglected to add is the oldest daughter, Elizabeth. She died giving birth to their sixth no, child. No. Five. Elizabeth died at seven. It was Ella. Oh, baby Ella, Ella yeah, baby. Okay. Keep me straight. I will. Okay. <laughs> she died giving birth to baby Ella? Baby Ella died giving birth to... That four Elizabeth, boys and baby Elizabeth, Ella was that, the only girl. Yeah, and a, a few years later, why, her husband passed away. So that left these five kids as orphans. And Grandpa and Grandma Schmidt adopted those five kids and raised them and sent every one of them to college. So they, in effect, raised 18 children. That's right, 18. 18. Yeah. Okay? That's right. right. That's right. That's pretty darn good. Yeah. That's cool. And then I wanted to bring up one thing uh, which I thought was not necessarily funny, but I thought it was kind of kind of nice to get involved in politics. <clears throat> Dad was Mr. Democrat for the 
state of South Dakota. And uh, he worked hard for the Democratic Party. And in 1972, there was a young man running for president against Richard Nixon. His name was George, a good name, George McGovern. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, it was a, oh, I think it was the middle of summer. I was just bringing cats and dogs outside there, 1972. And uh, all of a sudden, there was a knock on the door. He opened up the, his mother opened up the door, and here stands George McGovern. He walked all the way from downtown <coughs> to, to our house, which was about six blocks from the downtown area, just to say hello to Joe Schmidt. That just goes to show you what he thought about Joe Schmidt. <laughs> I'm not so, I just wonder how many, maybe very few of you have ever saw this bumper sticker that says, don't blame me, I voted for McGovern. <laughs> he ran against Richard Nixon when he impeached him. But uh, he was a very staunch Democrat. And in South Dakota, the Democrat was just nothing. And I finally got tired of not voting in the primary election because there was no opposition. So finally, lo and behold, I switched to the Republican Party so I could vote once in a while. And I know darn well that Joe Schmidt is down there rotating in. Rolling over, but he's rotating. Can I add a thought to that? And he must know this. My father voted for Eisenhower, a Republican. <laughs> he told me, and so did I. I swear it's true. <laughs> when, when I let people know that I voted for George McGuther in 1972, what did you vote for him for? And I tell him this story about George McGovern walking up in the rain, and he's dripping wet. He knocks on the door to see Joe Schmidt. I figure if he's good enough to do that, he's good enough for my vote. Hmm. But now, I want to tell you a little story about Joe Schmidt. Uh, my dad uh, used to smoke cigars. And us kids used to hate that. We used to sit in the back of this four-door touring sedan with a canvas roof and Isenglass side window. He'd blow that smoke at it. It's just horrible. <laughs> but anyway, I don't know why, but one day, all of a sudden, he quit smoking. And he was the world's worst critic of smokers from that time on. <laughs> he just hated it. So Francis was a heavy smoker, and Viola was a heavy smoker, and, and Bernard. And Bernard. You're all heavy smoker. I think I was smoking <coughs> at the time, too. But we were out to a, a picnic at Canyon Lake Park. And Joe, he always cooked steaks on a quarter-inch piece of steel, about three foot square. And he didn't have any fancy grill in there. He had this old rusty thing. And you get it real hot, and then you put sand on it, and oh. bacon grease and salt. And you scour it and get it <coughs> Well, while he's doing this, he's got a can of beer, and he's heisting it a little bit, and he probably went through about six of those. And finally, he got a little, you know, he's feeling a little happy. So he put on a straw hat, and he put a cigarette in his mouth, and he lit it, and he was running around there, and I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> see my dad with a cigarette in his mouth after all those years. Hey, if you remember that story, that picture's in this book. That's right. I yeah. that's You'll see him in the studio. Your dad's in there, too. He was probably smoking cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> All the stuff that was I, w I want to show you my favorite part. And is uh, Joe Schmidt around? Would you like to s tell the story of, of the book? The book? The book. The man I worked for at the American President Alliance was an avid Democrat, just like my father. As a matter of fact, I was interviewed by the California Employment Office of this company and as a secretary. And one would think that the first question would be, could he hire his opinion, take dictation, et cetera? But no, sir, I said, are you a Democrat? That was the first question. <laughs> and I said, I certainly am. My father is the uh, uh, chairman of the uh, South Dakota Democratic Society. And he said, you're hired. 
got this license. He figured, hell, I could fly any place. Here I had 35 hours of solo time and <laughs> didn't have no, no communication experience at all. So, uh, hell yeah, I'll fly you. It's at Huron. It's a, conven a democratic convention, or maybe the state convention. I think it was. So anyway, I, uh, Rapid City is 3,400 feet. Here's what, 900? Anyway, I didn't set the altimeter. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had an altimeter, a ball bank, and a, and a uh, tech. Our gas gauge is a little wire that danced up and down from the windshield out there. Well, anyway, we, uh, I got a road map, and you know, I can get the pier all right, and move gas up there. Here to Karen, where the convention was at, it was straight due east, follow 212. So I could follow 212. Unfortunately, we had a wind from the south, so I had to crab that airplane about 15 degrees to follow 212 and stay right on it. And the old man, Joe, he kept going. Nope, no, Dad, we got a law for wind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to dress, but I landed. He he went down to the hotel. And he said, "I want you at this dinner." I don't know what I'm dressed in, but I'm sure it's grubby. Anyway, I went down. And he introduced, "This is my son Leonard. He's a pilot, like I was a commercial." <laughs> that afternoon. Didn't have a radio. Never thought of checking the weather. And we headed back to Rapid City. 212 to Pier and then whatever it was to Rapid City. to Rapid City. Oregon. We got to about Myrtle and I see these old thunderheads. So I'm not going to go through those. I know not to do that. So I had to clear north up past Bear Butte. And that disturbed the old man a lot. He said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, we can't go through that storm. <laughs> so we got, got back of it. I got there. And the old man got out of that airplane and he was getting the board. Got to the car. He never 
got an airplane again. <laughs> 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 Did you ever fly with you, George? Yeah. I took him to uh, Ed Downs funeral at Watertown and Airplane. And we got home about 8 o'clock at night. He just wouldn't fly with you again. <laughs> we got home at 8 o'clock. We landed and we had a radio. It was pitch black. It was pitch black and we landed at the Rhapsody Airport. And he couldn't wait to get into the bar and get a drink. <laughs> this, this airplane we had was a 60 horsepower Franken engine around the tandem. I think the damn thing cost 850 bucks. <laughs> George tells me now if, I, if it's in mint condition, it's worth 35000 But I think Dad sold that in with that airplane shortly after his trip. <laughs> he uh, sold it when Gene Markham taxied it into the old stone hangar at the Rapid City. Uh, Municipal Airport, which is now part of Ellsworth, yeah. he taxied it right into the building. Instead of pushing it into the building, he hit another airplane and broke the prop. And it's for sale the next day. But anyway, he was, he was pretty proud of me being a pilot. <laughs>
I raced over to the doctor's office, and uh, he said, I called him, and he said, well, it's gonna, we'll have to charge you an office call, and I said, that's too bad, I'm coming. So I went over, and I said, I want to take my father home, back to the nursing home. I don't want any further surgery, no more medication, nothing. So, uh, uh, would you arrange for me to pick him up in the morning? He said, all right, that's the way you want it. So I went the next morning, or well, they called me before I got there, and they said, uh, would you wait until tomorrow to get your father? They had lost the catheter. <laughs> oh, and they weren't sure that they, or they had lost the thermometer, and they weren't sure that it wasn't still in bed. <laughs> <laughs> mother was so happy. But just a few minutes after we got there, the nurse put dad down. He wasn't going to go in the dining room, but mother went down. So I stayed with dad and I started to feed him a little broth or something. And he started gagging. So I ran and got the nurse and I said, I'll go stay with mother. Well, it was just a few minutes later he was gone. But he died peacefully in the nursing home and mother was there. She got to see him before he died. So he was ready to go. He didn't really much like this old age. <laughs> but that, those were the last years of his life. He re they really weren't all that bad. Is Bob fanting around? Oh. Yeah. Right. So I want to tell you a few things about Bob. Bob. Dad wouldn't have anything to do if, with anyone but Bob. If he messed his pants, he'd sit in it until Bob got there that night. Bob will clean me up. He was Bob just <laughs> his most beloved in law. And the nurses got so they didn't really like Bob and I too much because we were there so much that we knew what was going on. We knew darn well we'd take good care of. But that and that's that's the last year of your Oh, and then the day of the funeral, I have to tell you about Mama. Everybody went to Rapid City but Mother and I. And the day you had the funeral in Rapid City, Mother and I went to church. And the, the priest was saying sort of a funeral mass. Mother, there weren't many there, Mother and I. And Mother looked around and she said, Well, Millie, there aren't many people at Daddy's funeral. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I mention one more thing? Sure. I got to tell you this, because I know some of our brothers and sisters know this, but none of you kids know this. My dad is a very outgoing sort of a guy. And when we lived in Dallas, South Dakota, my dad sang in the choir. And my dad, you know what I'm going to say. My dad, and we had a priest come, and the priest would start talking. My dad figured he'd talk long enough to take a time. He went his great big watch, and he all over the church. <laughs> and the priest would get talking. That is the honest God truth. You remember that? I don't for dinner. And uh, met Joe and Kate for the first time. And uh, we were having pork roast that night. About time to serve, like Joe hands me uh, a platter and says, Go down, Bob, in the corner, bring up the sauerkraut. So I go down to the basement and I finally find the sauerkraut, lift the stone off of the plate. Just greener than hell. <laughs> Snake, you can't believe how. <laughs> so I go back upstairs and I say, uh, Mr. Schmidt, uh, I think it's spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe burst out of laughing and he said, Come on, that's the way it's supposed to be. That makes it good. <laughs> so uh, I, I take the next call. I was invited over to help make that sauerkraut, but I had to do it just right with the thin night or whatever, but uh, that, that, that was my first introduction. The second one, we were invited over, and I can't remember the occasion, but Joe and neighbor Abe Blumenthal had a snoot bowl. And, I, and I'm not sure whether Abe was uh, invited for dinner or not, but Joe started to carve, I don't know if it was a turkey or ham, and all came from the plate under the piano. <laughs> Joe never missed a lick. He just picked it up, just like nothing happened, and it went unmarried. <laughs> 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 
probably so. <laughs> any holiday. Put that in account. I think it's in there. Any any holiday, Joe Tushmid and Abe Blumenthal celebrate. I mean, they really celebrate. So uh, uh, it, it was fun. Day. I worked for Joe, and uh, I have to thank Joe for for my success because he taught me the business world. He was a tough tough guy to work for and a tough businessman. <coughs> father and these guys, he had to be a great father. <laughs> well, I went into the house one time to pick up Mildred, and I think it was Leonard, or maybe it was Ed, and they were chasing each other in the house with a butcher knife. <laughs> maybe it was a burner. Uh, because uh, they couldn't agree who was supposed to do the dishes then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I got to share one other thought with you about Joe Schmidt. Uh, Bob kind of hit the nail on the head. He said he's a good businessman. He was a shrewd thinker, too. The thing I want to bring out about this thing, he had five sons, and he never would let those five sons use his car for the simple reason that, and Chris will vouch for this, you put a male driver on there under 16 years of age, your premium went out of sight. <laughs> so every one of them, starting with Bernard, he taught us how to do this, Bernard. Uh, when Dad used to go to bed about 9, 9.30 at night, and he'd always leave his, in the summertime, he'd sleep out on the sun porch on 12th Street there. And he'd leave his pants hanging over a chair in the living room. And the pants always had the keys to the car in them. He, he knew what was happening here. But Bernard would sneak in there and, and take that car, and he'd have a buddy with him, and they'd push the car out to the garage, and then push it down the street about a block, and then start it up and turn on the lights, and away they go. And uh, the reason he, he did this he knew these guys were stealing these cars. His sons were stealing or borrowing it, you know, I say. Uh, but he figured, well, that's better than paying this tremendously high premium <laughs> for a male driver. He knew what was going on, but he never yeah. let on. Until, Until one night, I tried. worked <laughs> <laughs> pretty good. I had a couple of my buddies from high school with me. And we pushed that car out, and we pushed it down the alley over to South Street, and we fired it up, turned on the light. Oh, yeah, you disconnect the speedometer. Oh, yeah. it took about, that took about two minutes. And we drive a couple hundred miles, you know, and drive back. And we never would close the garage doors when we were out doing this because it made too much noise. So, uh, I brought, brought the car back, and you turn the, you get it going real good, about 20, 25 miles an hour, and you turn off the light, cut off the engine, and you coast right into that garage. <laughs> you get out of there, it's pitch black. It's pitch black. And we lived up on 12th Street, and behind us was agricultural land. There were cattle roaming all over the place. And I got out of the car, and I put one foot down, and it felt like, you know, kind of strange. I didn't think much of it, and I walked on in the house and went to bed. And uh, the next morning, uh, my dad came up to me and said, you took my car last night. He said, how'd you know that? And he picked up my shoe off the floor, and it was covered with cow shit. <laughs> the cow would come in there and drop the load. <laughs> Francis, Edwin, Leonard, George, Francis. Did Francis, did that? Francis didn't really steal the car, did he? He used to rat on you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the hell he didn't. <laughs> I didn't do any of these dirty tricks. They had let me have the car. <laughs> well, yeah, because they didn't charge for female drivers. Well, let's be honest about it. Dad had two favorites, two pets. <laughs> one a male and one a female. The, fe the female was this one, 
and Francis Paul was the male. No <laughs> wrong. <laughs> I'm just glad to hear that stealing the car and disconnecting the speedometer is genetic. <laughs> <laughs> because I did it and I found out my daughter did it. <laughs> I did too. <laughs> Doggone sophisticated cars they're building today, you can't get it done. You can't no, get it done. Not anymore. That's right. no, not I'm at 1936 old mill, you can reach under there in 10 seconds. You got that thing loose that's hanging down there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that 1940 Oldsmobile. He had a 1940 First Oldsmobile. Drive. And when he sold that car, how many miles did it have on it? Oh, it probably had uh, 90,000. Oh, I think it's over a hundred, but uh, yeah, but it had another hundred. It wasn't. <laughs> 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 he sold it. For, he had a 1940, a black gold uh, four-door sedan, and he sold that trade in and got a 1946 Bulls. And when Francis went to work for him, Dad gave him that car, and Dad got a big black 1998. And also. Didn't he get a, a plaque on his 20th Oldsmobile? Yeah, right. Yeah. From Tom From Paul. General Motors. They sent him a plaque saying, Joseph Schmidt is the one That's right. 20th Oldsmobile. Huh. <laughs> I, think, I think we've had enough reminiscing about uh, Joe. I don't know. Oh, no. <laughs> <story> <laughs> <Northern>. <laughs> this shows another side of Joe Smith that I don't have. And I think, Phyllis, you ought to take this. What? This, this story about when you and Francis lived in Denver and Francis worked at a grocery store, and somehow he lost his weekly check for a month. His what? His check. Check. His paycheck for the paycheck. For the week. You lost you it. Know, I think Grandpa loaned him some money, and he's in line at the post office that for day. something, and someone picks his pocket. Yeah. Well, anyway. And so there they stood. But, but Dad, Dad, uh, uh, there they stood. Give you enough money to live on, didn't he? I wasn't there. Is that the way it was? What? Didn't Dad give you enough money to live on? Oh, I don't remember that. Oh, I do. Somebody <laughs> told me that. And Dad was pretty... Probably made you Dad, 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 Dad was pretty close to Oh, yeah. Yeah, he didn't have much to spare in those days. <laughs> well, I just want to say one thing more. And it's on an entirely different subject. I want to thank Kathy Fenton. I mean, Pike, <laughs> and her dear husband, and her dear parents for putting this lovely reunion together. Yay! Questions in the audience. Someone want to say nice oh, air? I, I figured we could go all night. There's questions. Do any of you, do any of you recognize, those of you who know second and third generation Smith kids that are kids of these guys, do you recognize any of the traits of Joe? No, no. <laughs> like to have a beer once in a while. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know where we picked all that stuff up. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if any one of the grandkids know anything about Joe Schmidt, it'd be Chris. 
Chris ought to know a lot. I, there's got, I'm going to tell a story. Did, did any of you ever have the pleasure of playing bridge with Joe Schmidt behind you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I played bridge. Well, you'd, you'd be looking at your cards, trying to make a decision, and his arm would come over your head, pick a card. <laughs> said grace before meals, always. And my, my and, and then we had another, our father, the poor souls. And dad was always, dad was always in these three paragraphs ahead of everybody else. Remember that? When we said the Hail Mary, he was saying the whole Mary already. He was that, he was trying to get a finish. I understand it's raining out there, that it's under here it's not. <laughs> okay, keep going. I want, I want, I'm going to give this to Bernard tonight because he's leaving, and I ask you to be careful of it. There's, do, there's a lot of loose documents in it. Please keep now, them all together. You, let me ask you a question. If I see something to add on, do I take a piece of paper? There's, there's loose paper in there. Oh, Just write it on there. And show if the you, if you'd like copies of pictures or documents just write in there that you'd like copies of them and and i'll take care of it but take care of this be careful with it and we'll pass it around to another family after you get it okay one more thing before you leave this is bernie's last night i'd like to request that we get bernie's family up here for a group picture yeah 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 Yep. Right. You want me to cut it off now? Take the lens cap off. <laughs> <laughs>